So uh, the first thing I want to say is this is the second sort of web seminar that I've given in my life. And the first one was a surreal experience because when you lecture to an audience, you rely on eye contact and the you know, visual affirmation that people are paying attention. And when you lecture like this, it's you're just kind of talking to your computer screen. And after a while, it's very hard to tell whether. So it's, hard, it's almost hard to focus from the point of view of the lecturer because you feel like you're talking to yourself. So um, if that happens, feel free to unmute your phone and chime in that you're still with me. Um, because it's uh, it's a little bit odd from the speaker point of view. And uh, also I have to apologize in the background. You might hear screaming children, which will also be a bit distracting, and I hope that it will be kept to a minimum. So a little bit more just on my background. So, you know, you, the purpose of this lecture is to literally shift your paradigm of obesity. Um, and what's funny is when I wrote the New York Times Magazine article in 2002, I didn't actually think the way I did now, because I wrote that article from the perspective of the more informed members of the medical community who were getting in touch with the possible benefits of low-carbohydrate diets or the possible dangers of refined carbs and sugars, but they still tended to think of obesity the way we've always thought of it in terms of this overeating paradigm, which I'll get to shortly. And in the course of my research, and thanks to some very smart people who came before me, particularly a fellow named Alfred Pennington, I learned that that was actually not only wrong but nonsensical. And to, in effect, flip my own time. And what I'm hoping to do is to get you guys to flip yours in the course of an hour, those of you who haven't already done it by reading the book. Um, and then just a little bit of background. As a journalist, I began in the mid-'80s as a science journalist uh, focusing on good science and bad science. Uh, I lived at a physics laboratory for a year and wrote a book about some very, very smart physicists led by a Nobel laureate who discovered non-existent elementary particles. They got me obsessed with this idea about how hard it is to do science right and how easy it is to get the wrong answer. I then wrote a book about uh, cold fusion in which I this episode at the University of Utah back in 1989. I got obsessed with that. And the gist of it is, after that, some of my friends in the physics community said, if you think the science in cold fusion is bad, you should look at public health research. And since the early 90s, that's what I've been doing and trailing, sort of going from one uh, controversy to another until I wrote this piece in the Times in 2002 and got a large enough book advance to, in effect, dedicate my life to this research. And the result was good calories, bad calories. So let's start with the lecture now. Um, you're looking at the screen, why we get fat. So let's go to the next slide, which is the obesity epidemic. And I just want to make the point there that, you know, we're getting fatter and have been getting fatter consistently since, uh, well, the, the, the obesity epidemic, as we discuss it, begins, if you see these bars are all National Health Examination Nutrition Surveys, and there's NHES and then NHANES 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and the obesity epidemic began sometime between NHANES 2 and NHANES 3 when the obesity level in the U.S. jumped from 15% to 23%. Um, go to the next slide. Uh, this goes along with the diabetes epidemic. And as you could see, not surprisingly, since obesity and diabetes are so closely associated, but you could see that since 1980, um, diabetes diagnoses in the United States have almost tripled. Um, the percentage has, um, no, number of, total number of people has tripled. Um, so one reason this is very important from the physician's point of view is that virtually all the chronic diseases you deal with on a daily basis increase in <coughs> um, incidence with obesity. So the fatter you get, in effect, the sicker you get is one way to look at it. And this one, if you look at the next slide, the obesity epidemic, the burden of disease, we could have put insulin resistance at the center of this slide instead of obesity. But as obesity goes up or as in, you get more insulin resistance, uh, type, more likely to be type 2 diabetic, fatty liver disease, uh, heart disease, hypertension, stroke, cancer, asthma, uh, osteoarthritis, neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's goes up in incidence with obesity, gallbladder disease. 
And one way to look at it, which is not actually the way the medical community tends to look at it, but not only are you more likely to get any one of these diseases as you get heavier or as you get more obese, um, you could say that whatever makes you fat makes you sick. And that's, in effect, the general uh, hypothesis of good calories, bad calories. And then we're going to discuss what makes you fat. So here's the outline for the talk. And let's, uh, the next slide, why we get fat outline. And let's look first, okay, go to the next slide, conventional wisdom. So why do we get fat? And this seems pretty obvious, and it's always seemed pretty obvious, and it's what I believed up until about 2003. And the technical term is the energy balance hypothesis of obesity. You know, we eat too much, we take in more calories than we consume, and the excess is stored as fat. Um, calories in minus calories out. You hear this all the time from nutritionists, obesity researchers. It's all about calories in and calories out. Um, and uh, the official version of this, as you can see from the U.S. Surgeon General, go to the next slide, uh, overweight is a result of caloric imbalance, too few calories expended for the amount of calories consumed. It's mediated by genetics and health, or as the NIH put it, puts it, obesity occurs when a person consumes more calories from food than he or she burns. So that's the cause of obesity. And then what we want to do is explain the obesity epidemic from this hypothesis. So we've got this increasing level of obesity. Why have people been getting fatter for the past 30 years? So this energy balance hypothesis gets translated into this idea of improved prosperity, as Marion Nessel puts it. This is our next slide. People use extra income to eat more and be less active. Kelly Brown now, who's a psychologist who directs the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity at Yale, said we live in a toxic environment that encourages overeating and physical activity. So here's how Kelly put it, basically. You know, cheeseburgers and french fries, driving windows and supersizes, soft drinks and candy, potato chips and cheese curls, once unusual or as much our background as trees, grass, and clouds. Few children walk or bike to school. There's little physical education, computers, video games, televisions, keep children inside and inactive. Parents are reluctant to let children roam free to play. So the idea is basically, I mean, this is, you know, you hear this all the time. It's, uh, I was just watching a, a, a uh, one of these blogging head videos on the New York Times website, and a fellow was saying the way to get rid of childhood obesity is to get the soft drink dispensers out of school and to make sure there's no junk food within a mile of campuses and to increase physical activity in gym classes. Um, you know, it's just too much of everything. And so we eat too much, we're too inactive, we bring in too much calories, we expend too few, and that's the cause of the epidemic. And the obvious question, if you were a scientist, you would say, okay, this is a hypothesis. It sounds obvious, but it's a hypothesis. So you want to know, can it explain the observations? Or can we find observations that it can't explain? So one of the things I did in the course of my research, I went back and I looked at um, the uh, uh, all through the literature, looking for uh, places where people looked at obesity levels in populations that didn't have toxic environments. So you should now be up to slide number 12, called Obesity in Allegedly Non-Toxic Environments, the Fat Louisa Paradox. And that woman in the slide is Fat Louisa. She's a Pima Indian, and that photo was taken in 1902. And um, the story of the Pima, skip to the next slide, is it's kind of interesting. When they're, you know, they're famous nowadays as being sort of the poster children for obesity and diabetes in the U.S. because they have the highest rates or among the highest rates of any population. Um, but what people don't realize about them is the Pima used to be one of the most affluent Native American tribes in the country, if not the most affluent in the 17th, 18th, and first half of the 19th century. Um, they raised, they were hunter gatherers and agrarians, so they raised crops, they raised wheat and pigs, they had cattle, they um, hunted in the fields and the mountains, they fished in the Gila River and ate clams from the Gila River. And in 1846, when a, a U.S. battalion went through the Pima territory, the battalion surgeon um, described the Pima as sprightly and in fine health and said they had the greatest abundance of food and take care of it well. They had warehouses full of food. Um, and that drawing was made in 1852 by a traveler going to the Pima Territory.